You may be wondering why I'm playing with my organ in a crowded church. Well, this is Games Master, television's only video game magazine show. Coming to you from the only church in the country where Harry Seacombe is too fat to fit through the door. But we'll begin tonight with our initial game playing challenge, and to detail it, I hand you over to the celestial godfather, the Games Master. Hello. How kind of you to join me once again. I have to admit to being rather pleased with the three little challenges I have managed to concoct for you this week. To tee us off, we take to the fairways and putty greens of top players' golf. If you wish to complete my challenge successfully, you will need to play the first three holes of the country club course in level par. Best of luck. And attempting to keep his balls out of the bunker and in the holes in our first challenge is Mark Boduano. Now, Mark, I understand you're a bit of a mean golfer in real life. Well, that's right. I play uh, at Ross and Y Golf Club, and I have a handicap of four. All right. OK, now, how do you fancy your chances on the computer equivalent? Um, prefer to be doing the real thing, but uh, I'll give it a go. OK, if you'd like to get the feel of your clubs in our okay. hot seat, we'll get ready to tee off. And trying to keep me on the fairway is my own little handicap, Neil West from Sega Power. Welcome, Neil. Thanks very much, Dominic. Now, any general tips you can give Mark? Well, on the Neo Geo, um, yeah, the golf game's quite tricky. Um, basically, he's just got to make sure he stays on the fairway. That's the most important thing. And another little piece of advice is um, don't trust the caddy. Don't um, trust They the may caddy. look very, very pretty, but they often tell you completely the wrong thing. OK, then. Are you ready, Mark? Yeah. Then go to your caddy who's waiting for you at the first hole. OK, now on this first hole, he's obviously... What's he going to try and do with his first shot? OK, well, he's... First of all, he's, he's taking a wise precaution of having a look about the course before he starts, yeah? He's got to set himself up for his shots, and so he'll have worked out that, that he needs a shot onto the first fairway. Let's see if he's made it. Thwax that one. Oh, my dear, he's hooked out a little bit, but it's sneaked onto the fairway. Very, very fairway. Onto the fairway. Well... Very risky shot, but it's paid off a bit. It has paid off indeed. He's now set up very nicely indeed. <laughs> OK, now we're coming up for the second stroke here. OK, he's, he's using a four iron, um, and he must... Right, this metre up here, he's gone for a 100% strength shot, which is quite risky, because he now runs the risk of either slicing oh, or hooking it. Oh, is it going to run out in the fair? Yeah. green? Yes, it's on the fair. Oh, no, it's got the foul. Oh, my word! Just slipped off <laughs> of the green there, into the rough at the side. But nevertheless, quite a good stroke. Almost yeah. an excellent shot. Very, very good indeed. He's picked himself a sandwich, a little chip a little shot. delicate chip. Oh, my word, he was nearly sunk at there. He's but he's left on the green for his par putt. OK, he's got to get a par to stay in the running for the challenge. Green he's got a par each right. hole, so it looks like he's OK on this one, if he can just sink this putt. And, and yes, it's in there! He's done it. So now we're going on to the second hole. Quite a tricky, thin little hole, this one, Neil. Yeah, that's right. There's a couple of really nasty bunkers, and if he really takes a swipe and mucks it up, he's going to end up in the sea. He's picked himself a one wood, and off he goes. 100% whack. Oh, and he wallops and that it one. looks and it... to be doing OK. What a nice stroke. Couldn't have been much better, could it? Lovely first stroke there from him. 213 yards, that really is a very good shot. OK, now he's going to whack it again there. Is he going to stay on? Oh, he may have just over the net. He may well be going for the bunker here. It's just... Oh! Just on the rim of the bunker there, Neil. Very this, dangerous. This guy's got luck on his side. Yeah, 90 yards. The sand wedge would actually do it, yeah? Or he's, he's going for a pitching wedge as it happens. He's Give him a little bit more length. That's right, especially important. when you consider he's in the rough. Right. Nice oh. lofted club. Here we go, this one should sail straight up in the air. Yep, there it goes. Oh. You can follow the shadow on the ground. Right. And oh. he... Is it going to creep on the green just about? He might... Oh, no, he didn't make it. Oh. It's in the rough. That was bad luck. But again, that was only his third shot, and he's got another two to get it in. He's I mean, still on course. And to win the challenge, all he has to do is stay on par. That's right. A nice little chip up. Oh, my word, it could be going in. Oh! <laughs> that was a beautiful little shot. And he should be set up here for the par, Neil. He should. If he misses this, he'll never forgive green himself. Slope. Uphill to the right. OK, look at the slope in the bottom left-hand corner. Right. You can see that the green's sloping from bottom left to top That's right. A bit more power required. Bit more power. Oh, oh, no, and he's oh, missed too it! Too much! Oh, my word! And it, now he's left himself a dreadful shot to try and get back. This is a very tough shot. Just a little bit too much power in this putter. Yeah. Beginning yeah. to feel the pressure, I think. So he really must... But he did right. it. Right! OK. 
Now it leaves it very interesting because he must have a birdie on this final hole, Neil. So he's really got to get on the green with this opening shot. He certainly has. And he's given it a thwack. Come on, he could be... Oh, no, it's falling a bit short. Oh, no, he's going to go in the bunker. Now this is his last stroke, Neil. Basically, it's, he's going to need a miracle from this position. He certainly is. Um, it looks as if the only thing he'll come away with is a dinner date tonight. But... OK. Oh, good. Oh, no. Oh, my one has gone the worst. Is he oh, going to do no! it? <laughs> so that means that Mark has gone over par and his challenge has sadly ended in abject failure. Bad luck, Mark. You started off very well, parred the first hole, but then it seemed to be when you got into the green, your trouble started. The nearer you got to the hole, the more nervous you got. I really couldn't judge the pace of the greens at all, and uh, I've just messed up. <laughs> OK, well, we've very much enjoyed having you on the show. Have you enjoyed it, Mark? Yes, thanks, Dominic. OK, a round of applause again for our Gallic contestant, Mark Bonuano! <laughs> and while Mark treads back to Ross on wife for a sad stroke or two on his own, we're going to cast our eyes over the latest reviews. This week, we take to our TARDISes and have a look at futuristic games. First up on the Amiga, fight through claustrophobic corridors of furious facehuggers in Alien Breed. The scenery is, is very detailed, um, a lot of interesting lighting effects, which work quite well. I enjoy the game, but basically, it goes on the same night like, shooting the monsters. The same monsters appear all the time. Well, Alien Breed is very atmospheric, but if you're looking for an involved space adventure to blast away it for a while, you're going to be disappointed because it's the same a lot of the time. Get ready! Next up, forget fair play as the sport of the future comes to the Mega Drive in Speedball 2. It's basically like football with, with no rules. And the fact that you can beat the shit out of each other um, does make it far more entertaining than a straight football game. I think we can buy and transfer players is a really good idea so you can build your team up. I'd definitely recommend it. If you've got a Mega Drive and you've seen the Amiga version and interested in it, then you'll still find it a wholesome game that you can really get stuck into, even if there are a few presentation quirks that don't make it quite as good. Finally, on the PC, take to the stars for some aerial acrobatics in Wing Commander 2. It's a lot of flash presentation and a lot of attempt to create an atmosphere with the graphics. And the thing is, when you get down to it, the, the graphics is all there is. There's not a lot of depth to the gameplay at all. It looks all very nice, but incredibly boring to play. Very, very dull. And now for this week's feature. With a cornucopia of new consoles either having just been released or about to hit the scene, console buyers face greater choice than ever before. Over the next few weeks, we'll be finding out whether these machines are the ultimate in gaming fulfilment or simply all mouth and no trousers. Today, Paul Lakin, editor of GameZone magazine, casts his peepers at the Neo Geo. Most consoles claim to have arcade style, arcade quality graphics and sound. With the Neo Geo, you've actually got an arcade machine. If you possess your own Neo Geo, you can go and play the game in the arcade, save your game position on a credit card, take it home and continue playing at home. Quite why you'd want to do that, I don't know. The machine itself is very impressive. It's got over four, the capability to put over 4,000 colors on screen at one time, and its 24-bit processor is the most powerful available at the moment. If you're feeling rich, and you're feeling like the most powerful machine available, then the Neo Geo is the one to have, but it is a lot of money. of stonking games there. Now about this time every week I don't have fancy a celebrity challenge. Well this week is no different. To hear all about it, let's call up Games Master. Nice to see you again. I do hope you enjoyed my last little jaunt. For my second challenge this week, I thought we might take to the piece with Ski or Die, a most amusing little game in which carefree young stunt skiers, or hot doggers as I believe they're called, perform dazzling aerial acrobatics. You will have three jumps with which to impress the panel of six judges. Marks are awarded for speed, altitude, difficulty at manoeuvre, and grace. So come out spinning and reach for the skies. 
Well, our next two competitors are particularly suited to this game. Game players extraordinaire, as well as being masters of the piste. They're also two of the nation's most favorite DJs. From Capital Radio, please flap your hands fervently for Pat Sharp and Mick Brown. <laughs> Now, um, Mick, first of all, how long have you been a joystick waggler? Well, I've been a joystick waggler for quite a few years. I was once arrested for it, but ever since <laughs> I took up this, I've found that you can't get arrested for it, so it's been quite a few years. OK, now, Pat, we know you're a games fan as well, but you're also quite a big skiing freak also. Yeah, as you said, Dominic, you know, going on the piste is fun, but it's the old Apre ski that I prefer, just taking it easy, but I'm going to give it my best shot today. OK, now, I know there's a bit of rivalry between the two years. I have to ask you, Pat, can you take Mick? I'll have to ask my wife first. <laughs> OK. <laughs> To find out who wins this celebrity battle of the joystick tuggers, join us after these messages. Welcome back. We're getting ready for the battle of the DJs here. Mick Brown against Pat Sharp in an aerial skiing contest. Joining me in my pulpit piece from Computer and Video Games magazine is Tim Boone. Hello, Dominic. Tim, welcome back. Um, any general tips you could give to our two DJ game players? Sure. The tips I'd give the guys is to waggle the joystick like hell before you actually take off to get as far off as you can into the atmosphere and do as many loops and back spins and flips as you can. Really impress those judges. Really go for it, basically. OK, speed, skill and smoothness then, guys. Are you ready? Ready. OK, Mick, take your first jump. Now, Mick's obviously going to try and get as much speed as he can to Absolutely. He's going to wiggle that joystick like crazy to get to when he hits the end of the slope. He's off into orbit. Oh, and he's up high. It's a dappy and a double Mobius flip. He's got to straighten up. He's straightened up. What an opening nice jump from Mick Brown. Very, very nice jump indeed. Oh, very low nice to nice high jump. sixes. What a stunning opening jump. Average 31.9. And now, Mick, take your second jump. jump out. So he's going to try and build up as much speed as possible. He's coming tearing down there. Off the lip of it. And it's up. Oh, oh, someone's gone oh, wrong. Something oh, wrong. dear. And the crowd don't like that oh. one. But he scored remarkably highly, Tim. Why was that? It was a very clean jump. It was very fluid, but he didn't do very much. The judges are looking for fluidity and confidence as but well. But they like a bit of smoothness. Yeah, but what, for the really high points, they like the action. <clears throat> OK, then, so Mick, take your third and one. final jump. This is the big one. Let's go! Oh. So Mick's going to go all out here. He's mad and he's going to like mad. He's going to the lip. And he's, oh, one Daffy, two Daffys, stuck in a Daffy and landed. That's a, uh, a safe jump. A, a safe, safe jump, jump, quite a low score, but it could be enough, an average of 13.0. So Mick's total is, in fact, a mammoth 54.5. Well, Tim, Pat's going to have his work cut out to match that. How Definitely. would you advise him to take each of his jumps? I think that he should put some points straight down by doing a, a straightforward jump on the first jump. And if that's successful, really go for it. I'm talking about a triple loop, possibly. OK, let's see if Pat takes your advice. Pat, when you're ready, take your first okay. jump. Oh. And there goes Pat down the slope. He's getting as much speed as he can. He's up the top. Ooh. He's done one that He's done one flip. This could be a big one. It's... Oh. Pat averages 4.9 for his first jumps. Tim <laughs> just tried to be a bit too special, didn't Absolutely. he? Absolutely. The very last minute was just too ambitious. Should have left it as it was, gone for those big points, and he would have scored a massive amount for that. OK, so Pat needs quite a big jump here now. Here he goes to the second jump. And he's going down the wrong way. He's approaching the lip. It's a nice, clean exit. Oh. One daffy, one flip, two flips. Room. He's got a straight up here now. Oh. 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 oh, and he's he scored more than the judges there, 7.4. Now, by my calculation, he's got to score over 30 for his final jump. Tim, is it possible? He can do it, but it's got to be something... <laughs> he's got to go into orbit, basically. Right, and he's got to land safely. Yeah. That's where yeah. Pat's problems are, Absolutely. coming down to earth. OK, Pat, your fans are cheering you on. Take your third and final jump. <laughs> and Pat's bombed in the room. He's given it all this time. He's up in the air. He's done one oh, backflip with oh, a tough oh, one, Daffy. Oh, he has a straight up. Oh, he's straight up just in time. 3.9, 3.8, 3.1, 3.8. <laughs> 80.3 average. I don't think that's enough, Tim. It was a good jump, but it simply wasn't enough. He needed something very spectacular there. OK, and the final score for Pat was 40.6. Just edged out by Mick, who is tonight's winner. <laughs> Well, first of all, congratulations, Mick. Thank you very much.
incredibly smooth jump in there. How did you manage to trounce Pat so thoroughly? Well, it was all down to training. You know, I was out at uh, Hampstead Heath the other night, and uh, <laughs> it all kind of worked well. You know, it was a bit cold, and it was great. It just paid off training. OK, well, now, Pat, you did some very fancy work, but you just seemed to be trying to do a bit too much there. Well, my jumping's a bit like my jumper, really, a bit too much, so that's why. I can quite agree with that. Yeah, that's the thing. Well, I'm afraid, Pat, that you've missed out on our star prize, which goes to Mick. <gasps> Now, Mick, I'm sure I'm it a, uh, it's even better than a car. I'm sure you've won many awards for DJing, but none as special as this. Ship around the world. Our special, huge, golden Games Master joystick. <laughs> now, now, Mick, you can take that home, and I'm sure you could do a lot of damage with something like that. I'm sure it could do a lot of damage to someone, yeah. So <laughs> I shall gladly uh, accept this on behalf of uh, Capital FM, because I think, well, actually, what we'll do, Pat, we'll put this in the Capital Foyer in London, so everyone can come up and uh, have a gaggle at my joystick. OK, great. <laughs> Another round of applause for Pat Sharp and Mick Brown. <laughs> Now, Pat and Mick obviously have their problems. We can't help them. However, if you do have a problem on a computer game, send it into Games Master and we'll see what he can do about it in the consultation zone. Hello, Games Master. Welcome to my kingdom. I am delighted to see you. And what have you got to ask me? I've been playing Zelda for months but I can't find the Guardian on level 7. Can you tell me where it is, please? Zelda does indeed require a modicum of common sense. To locate the particular Guardian you're after, go to the top right-hand corner room, kill hands, and then push the rock over to the right. A secret passage will appear, and if you go down it, you will find the Guardian. Thanks, love. Next, please. Hello, Games Master. Hello, and nice to see you. Now, what can I do for you? I keep getting killed at the end of the Dust Planet in Forgotten Worlds. How can I destroy the Dust Dragon? Foolish boy. It sounds to me as if you've been overlooking the fact that the dragon's only weak point is its heart. Shots aimed anywhere else are simply wasted. If you stray low to avoid the Razor Claws and keep firing at the heart, you should have no trouble disposing of the beast. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. I'm sure you'll be very glad to see the back of that one. Next, please. I've been told there's a warp on level one of Snake, Rattle and Roll, but I haven't been able to find it. Can you tell me where it is, please? Indeed I can, young man, though I do feel you should have moved on from this game a long time ago. Oh, well, no matter. From the start, keep going right as fast as possible, avoiding all obstacles. Eventually, you will see a rocket. If you jump up and catch the rocket, you can walk to level eight. That's great. Thanks very much. Well, you will find it works. And that little revelation brings the session to an end. I do hope the advice is going to be of some use. Goodbye for now. Now it's time for this week's final challenge. Let's go over to Games Master to find out what it's about. The last of this week's challenges is on a game called The Rat in which you need to guide an innocent, nappy-clad babe through a perilous maze where all manner of dangers lurk. Your task is to get through stage one of level five. Anticipation is the key. If you let the child cop it, or if you dawdle and get caught by the scrolling screen, the challenge is over. Good luck. The life of an innocent child is at the mercy of your mouse finger. And here, attempting to guide his very own child through the perils of our final challenge tonight, please could you give a very warm Games Master welcome to Michael Merrin. <laughs> welcome to Games Master, Michael. Must be here. Now, I think this is an incredibly tough game. Are you confident about it? Um, just slightly, not very much though. <laughs> right, have you been practicing a lot though? Um, for a few days. <laughs> okay, would you like to go and have a little sit down in our pine hot seat there and we'll get ready to start the game? Sure. Joining me again as co-commentator is the lovely Tom Watson from Renegade. Welcome back, Tom. Evening, Dominic. Tom, what should Michael's general tactics be on Brat? 
particularly on this level, what he has to watch out for is the screen scrolling down and knocking the character off. Right, okay, Michael, are you ready? Get guiding that baby. Okay, what's the first obstacle he must overcome here then? Well, the first thing for Mike to watch out for, Dominic, is the shark, which we can see in the bottom right. What he's doing at the moment is he's picking up as many of these items as he can find. He'll need to use a lot of them later on. As you can see, he's put a triangle down there, which will stop the screen from scrolling down. This gives him more time to plan to put out the items which are going to stop things. He's put some meat in the river. That's taken the shark out for a while. OK, now he's coming at a crossroads here. How could he go over these gaps here? Oh, he's putting them bridges. Yeah, he's building the bridges. You can see a number five above the bridge icon in his uh, control panel. That shows how oh, many he can Oh, a little use. fellow there. Is that a little prick and he's disappeared? Uh, he has indeed. He's gone sailing upwards. Now, he just has to... Watch out now for you know, so getting around this. There's a slide coming up, and he's blowing, using his dynamite to blow up the bricks. He's got another shark to take out. And is that a submarine he's about to pick up? That's a submarine. He's going to need that a little bit later on, yes. OK, so how is he doing now at the game? He's doing pretty well. He's probably about halfway through at the moment. He's stopped on the edge. He's distracted the shark with some meat. Right. Now he's given an instruction to the character to go on further. Right, what's this in the water here? Oh, that's gone as well. Now, how far is he through the game, Tom? He's about halfway down there. I think he's doing extremely well. Yeah, okay, so he's still here items. He's got a bone there. Will that come in useful? The bone will come in useful right at the end of the level. Now he's going to slide down this. He's put a stop token down. He's missed it. Oh, and there he goes. He's just bought it. Commiserations, Michael. Um, talk us through it. You were going very well, but then what went wrong? Well, I uh, put a stop sign down in the wrong place where uh, I wanted to stop, and the dog obviously came after me um, where I should have had a bone, so I kept going instead of stopping. <laughs> right, well, you had the bone, but didn't quite get the stop sign That's in place. It, yeah. Well, have you enjoyed yourself anyway, Michael? Yes, it's been great fun, yeah. Well, we've certainly enjoyed looking at you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much again. Michael Merrin. <laughs> So that's it for tonight, but there's a sniff of Darjeeling in the air. So it's on with the smoking jacket and off to the cloisters. Keep pounding the keyboard and we'll see you in seven days. Good night. Dominic will be back on Monday at 6.30. Tomorrow at 6 o'clock, it's stars in their eyes. Yes, indeed, with Matthew Kelly. Coming up later on this evening, well, right after this break, actually, we've got Robotica. <laughs>